and congratulations on buying your new JVC GR45 video movie. This is the most advanced camcorder available, with a host of technological features which make it one of the simplest to use. We want you to get the very best from your GR45, and that's why we've produced this video presentation, which will introduce you to the main features of the camera and help you master the basic techniques of video photography. We'd also like to invite you to join the JVC Video Movie Owners Club, which will help you develop your camera technique and learn how to get the best creative effects from your video movie. We'll tell you more about that at the end of the program. Right now, I'd like to hand you over to Leslie Judd, who will show you just how easy it is to get professional looking results with your JVC GR45 video movie. Hello, and welcome to the exciting world of television production. Now, I say television production because that's exactly what you'll be doing with your new JVC GR45, producing video programs to be watched on your own television. Now, the GR45 is the most advanced camcorder available, but, as with most creative tools, it is only as good as its operator. All too often, we hear of camcorder owners losing interest in their new hobby because they haven't been able to achieve the professional-looking results that they'd expected. And yet, all that it takes to produce interesting and well-made video programmes is to follow a few simple but very essential rules. To help you get off to the best possible start with your new hobby, JVC have produced this training video especially for GR45 users. The programme covers some of the main features of the unit and teaches you the all-important rules of creative video production. This tape is not intended to replace the excellent GR45 instruction manual, but to supplement it. So, we recommend that after you've viewed this tape, you read the instruction manual in full before rushing out to produce your first masterpiece. In common with other camcorders, the GR45 consists of four main components. There's the lens unit, which determines the focus, the focal length, and the amount of light entering the camera part of the unit. The camera body, which contains all the electronic circuitry that converts the light and information entering the lens into a colour video picture. The recording unit, which records the colour video picture onto the videotape and also allows playback to the monitor or a TV set. And the electronic viewfinder, basically a small television set, which monitors the picture both during recording and playback. Now, because these four components make up a single unit, it follows that there must also be a number of controls on the camcorder. The operational controls fall mainly into two categories, those that control the camera functions and those that control recording and playback functions. When the unit is switched on, the main camera controls on the GR45 go immediately into a mode known as full auto. And in this full auto mode, the focus, exposure and white balance are under automatic control and the standard shutter speed selected, leaving you free to concentrate on the pictures you're taking. Now, providing lighting conditions are favourable, this is the setting that you should generally use when out recording. However, there will be situations where you'll need to override one or all of these automatic functions. Here, for example, our subject is behind a mesh fence. The autofocus has locked onto the fence, leaving our subject out of focus. If we switch to manual focus using the focus button, we can adjust the focusing ring to bring our main subject into focus. The simple rule of manual focusing is to zoom in tight on your subject, adjust the focusing ring until you gain a sharp picture, and then pull out to the desired position. the subject will remain in focus as long as it remains approximately the same distance away from the camcorder. As an added benefit, the GR45 also has a correct focus indicator on the viewfinder screen when switched to manual focus mode. The GR45's LCD display panel here will keep you fully informed as to the current setting of the focus control and likewise the white balance mode is also displayed. Now, white balance is a term that often worries newcomers to video photography, and yet there's really no reason to be afraid of it. Let's briefly examine what the term means. To produce accurate colour pictures, 
a video camera divides visible light into three separate colours, red, green and blue. These three colours, known as the primary colours, are chosen because when mixed in the correct proportions, they make white. By varying the proportions of these primary colours, any other colour can be created. Now, the video camera is designed to use white as its reference point and providing it registers the correct shade of white, then it will faithfully reproduce all the other colours. Now, if the visible light, that's the light that's all around us, was constant, then the video camera would always provide perfect colour reproduction. Unfortunately, though, it's not as simple as that, because visible light has what is known as colour temperature. The light around us is made up from various coloured components. A relationship exists between the temperature of a light source and the coloured components of the light that it gives out. As the temperature rises, the colour of the light varies from red, orange, yellow, white to blue, in that order. Now, although our own eyes don't detect these colour changes, the video camera does, so that when recording pictures indoors, using ordinary filament light bulbs for illumination, the video camera would detect a reddish tint to the visible light. Out of doors, the sun is our light source. This has a much higher colour temperature than a light bulb, and as such gives a blue tint to the visible light. And it's for this reason a video camera has a white balance control. It compensates for these colour temperature variations of light so that whites and colours are always faithfully reproduced. We mentioned earlier that the GR45's white balance control is automatic, activated when the unit is switched on. However, occasionally we may need to override the automatic setting. This would normally be the case when recording in low light situations. To manually adjust the white balance is a simple procedure. By pressing the button marked white balance, we can select one of three settings, indicated by a symbol shown on the LCD display panel. Now, select this symbol when recording using halogen or tungsten lamps, this one for fluorescent lighting, and the sun symbol for out of doors. Next to the white balance button is the shutter button, and that allows you to activate a variable shutter speed. By pressing the button, you can select shutter speeds of 1,000th, 1,500, 1,250 or 1 50th of a second. The setting you choose will be indicated within the LCD display. This feature allows you to get really sharp, clear shots of fast-moving subjects, or when panning the camera. Whatever the filming conditions, you can eliminate blurring of your subject by selecting the appropriate shutter speed. Pressing the full auto button there will return the shutter speed to standard and also immediately return the focus and the white balance controls to the automatic mode. Now, one automatic mode that can't be switched to manual is the iris. To maintain correct exposure, the iris will automatically open and close to let the desired amount of light enter through the lens. Under normal recording conditions, no problems of course. If, however, there is excessive lighting behind the subject, then the iris will adjust itself to give correct exposure to the background, and this leaves the subject underexposed and in the dark. Now, you can compensate for this by using the backlight button, which is located under the lens unit. Whilst the button is being pressed, the iris will open up one or two stops. This will, in effect, overexpose the background but in doing so, it will give your subject more exposure. The reset and memory buttons act in the same way as those on an ordinary home video recorder, allowing you to time your recording lengths and making it easy to find a memorised point on the tape. Moving around to the back of the unit and you'll find the recording and playback functions. Again, much the same as an ordinary home video. The GR45 has a quick review function to help you avoid wasting tape. You can play back your last two seconds of footage to check that you're using the right settings and that recording conditions are adequate before you continue. After reviewing, the camcorder reverts to standby, ready for you to start shooting again. Now the handle is located on the right-hand side of the unit here, and with your hand inserted through the strap, you've then got easy access to the record and pause trigger. There it is.
And to make sure that you always know when shooting has started or stopped, the GR45 also has a trigger alarm, which emits a single beep when shooting commences and two further beeps when you release the trigger. And this alarm can be switched on or off manually. The rocker switch on the top of the handle controls the power zoom. By pressing it back and forth, you can select any focal length from telephoto all the way to wide angle. The speed of the zoom depends on how far you depress the rocker control. All the way down, and the time is five seconds from one end of the zoom range to the other. And only halfway down, and the time will be nine seconds. The electronic viewfinder is designed to tilt upwards for taking low angle shots and has a hinged eye cup to let you verify the scene that you wish to shoot. As well as letting you monitor what picture your camcorder is recording, the viewfinder also lets you watch your recorded footage on playback. Also, within the viewfinder frame, you'll find clearly displayed all the important information that you need to know while shooting or preparing to shoot. Light levels and low light warnings, shutter speeds, white balance, standby and recording indicators, low contrast warning, standard or long play setting, date, time and fader indicators, and a low battery indicator. And in the center of the viewfinder is the manual focusing aid. Now you'll notice that when the camcorder is switched on, a date and time indicator will show in the viewfinder. This switch is on automatically for your first shot, but subsequent shots will require you to switch on the clock yourself. And it's very simple to set as well. It's very much like uh, a digital watch, and it also tells you how much recording time has lapsed. So, as you can see, once you've mastered the simple operating procedures, the GR45 is a very versatile piece of equipment. It's at this stage that most camcorder owners go off into the wild blue yonder, recording anything and everything that gets in the way of the lens. footage, the next step is to sit the family in front of the television set, start the tape playing and wait for their reaction. Unfortunately, even the most loyal members of your family will lose interest in your new hobby when subjected to this sort of visual torture. To avoid this happening to you, we're now going to show you the basics of television production. Let's look at why we need special production techniques for television. Well, as we go about our normal daily business, we look around us. We're watching, interpreting what we see into useful information. And this is called free selection. However, if we use this free selection to produce our video programs, we'd invariably get poor results. That's because good production techniques rely more on guided viewing, that is, guiding your viewer's eyes to the relevant point that you wish to emphasize. So, why do we have to guide our viewer's eyes with our video camera when in normal daily life our viewers are quite capable of making these viewing decisions for themselves? The main reason for using guided viewing is that the limited size of the television screen doesn't allow our viewer to see both detail and an overall view simultaneously. When we use a, a wide angle shot, we see more of a scene, but individual details are so small they lose impact. On a tight shot, we gain the impact desired, but lose the overall view. So, to achieve visual interest, we must vary between close, medium and wide shots. Careful selection of these shots will convey the maximum information to our viewer. And we'll look at these shots in greater detail later. But before we continue, let's just reflect on how our own eyes and brain work together to give us information relevant to the scenes we're looking at. We don't need to see every action that's going on to give us the full story. In fact, 
when we look from one object to another, our eyes and brain automatically edit out the panning action between the two objects. If they didn't, our whole life would consist of views like this. Our brains also allow us to deduce valuable information from limited sources. For example, here we see a close-up of a hand holding a pen and writing. We obviously know that there's a person attached to the hand. We can tell it's a male by the size and shape of the hand. We are automatically curious to know what our author looks like. And the next shot shows us. And although we only see his face, our brains have assumed that this face is the one belonging to the person doing the writing. However, because our eyes and brain work together in this manner, we must be very careful how we link our pictures. For example, this shot, linked to this one, or this shot, linked to this one, can and will confuse your viewer's senses. A shot is what we call each individual picture we take. It's similar to a word. If we can put together a series of shots into a logical sequence, then we have a scene. Just as when we put together a series of words in a logical sequence, then we have a sentence. A good video photographer will use many different shots from different angles and at varying focal lengths to make an interesting scene. So let's consider those four standard shots. Each has its own name and purpose within a production. The long shot is very useful as an establishing shot because you can get the greatest amount of information in the frame at one time. If the subject is a person, you would see the full person and the background. Try to consider the background when using the long shot because of the visual information it will carry. It's very easy when out recording to concentrate only on the main subject, but if you ignore the background, you could end up with shots like these. When using the long shot as an establishing shot, it's normally used at the start of a scene and will set the scene for the action to follow. Next, the medium shot. Now this has the effect of making the viewer want to get closer to the subject. A medium shot of a person is from the waist up and with more detail on the subject rather than on the background. Then the close-up shot is probably the easiest and most overused shot. It's a shot we use to highlight a certain point within a scene. On a person, the close-up covers the, the head and shoulders and the background is less noticeable. When a close-up is not important, it's best to pull out to a medium shot so when you next use the close-up, it has more visual impact. The fourth shot is the extreme close-up. Now use this shot when close detail is required to strengthen a message. The frame will be totally dominated by the close-up shot and when used on a person, it can convey a lot of information to the viewer about how the subject is feeling sadness, happiness, tension, etc. It can all be conveyed in this one simple shot. Now don't be afraid to use this shot, but remember, it should only be used for the specific purpose of highlighting. Well, these are just the four basic standard frames, and of course, many other shots lie between these four. What about camera movements? Well, there are several standard camera movements, and it's important to note that when you move the camera, you're really moving the audience's attention from one area to another. First, the pan. Now, the pan is the easiest camera movement, but mustn't be overused. Panning is moving the camera horizontally from left to right or right to left. To pan correctly, there has to be a starting and a finishing frame. Hold the opening frame, and then when there's any movement or cutting point, start to pan and try and make this movement slow and even. Hold the camera steady on your end frame and then cut or pause. Remember, you're taking the audience from one place to another, so make that pan as even and smooth as possible. The tilt is the same as the pan, but instead of horizontal, it's a vertical camera movement. Hold the starting frame, just as if you were panning, 
and then move the camera up or down as evenly as possible and then hold the end frame. The speed of the tilt should be slightly faster than the pan. Now another form of camera movement is the use of the zoom lens. The zoom lens was originally designed to enable the video photographer to get nearer to the subject visually without physically having to move closer. However, recording a zoom can make an interesting shot, especially to establish your subject within the surroundings. Never zoom in and then out again or vice versa. It looks amateurish and adds nothing to the presentation. It's a common fault with most beginners to overuse the zoom. Zooming is a shot that calls a lot of attention to itself and the audience will be very distracted by constant use of this movement. Now, what about camera angles? Well, we normally shoot from shoulder height. However, altering the angle can dramatically alter the whole nature of the subject on the screen. Shot from a low angle, our subject looks larger and far more impressive. The same subject shot from a high angle looks smaller and less significant. There are a few specific rules relating to the framing of a subject on the screen that we must now look at. Imagine your television screen as a, as a picture in a frame. Now you would want to see a picture that is pleasing to the eye. For television, we must film our subjects in a way that not only looks good on screen, but also conveys a message to our viewer. Here, our subject is admiring the view. It's an easy shot, yet somehow the frame doesn't look quite right. That's because we haven't left what is known as a looking space. There, see the difference? By leaving a bigger gap in front of the subject, the viewer will eagerly wait to see what the subject finds so interesting. It doesn't matter what shot you put next, the viewer will think that is what your subject was looking at. You must also leave a looking space when filming a subject talking or listening to another subject off screen. A similar rule applies when filming a moving subject. This time, the space is known as the leading space. It allows the viewer to see slightly in advance where the subject is walking to, which helps them to relate to the scene. And the same rule applies to any other form of moving subject. And while we're on the subject of movement, we must be aware of another rule of filmmaking. That is, continuity of action. Now, quite simply, this means that when recording continuous action of the same subject, the general direction of the movement must be consistent on the screen. This car, for example, pulls away in a left-to-right direction. The following shots must continue in the same direction, left-to-right across the screen, to maintain visual continuity. If, however, we cross the road with our camcorder, the car appears to have switched direction completely and now goes right to left on screen. And that's very distracting for the viewer, unless, of course, you want your viewer to think that the car has made a U-turn. What has actually happened is that by crossing the road, we inadvertently crossed the line. Well, what line is this, you may well ask? Which brings us nicely onto the next rule of video production the line of action and the 180 degrees rule. To avoid visual discontinuity, imagine a line drawn through the screen that you're shooting. We can move our camera to any position within 180 degrees of this line and still maintain visual continuity. Let's look at an example. Here, we're establishing the scene using a long shot. To add interest, we cut to a medium shot favouring the girl. Reversing the camera angle, we now cut to a medium shot favouring the boy. Again, moving back to the opposite position, we cut to a close-up shot of the girl. Note that even though we cannot now see the boy, we know that he's still there by following the eyeline of the girl. By shooting in this format, we don't lose continuity at all. What happens when we cross the line? As you can see, we completely destroy the visual continuity by reversing the images on the screen. Producing an interesting video program in general only requires the highlights of the event to be recorded. The challenge to you, the video photographer, is to link all those selected shots together to form an interesting sequence.
To help us bridge the gap between the actions and positions of our subject on the screen and to cover lapses in time, we use what is known as cutaway and cut-in shots. A cutaway shot is, in simple terms, a shot that acts as a neutral link in between two other shots. Now here we've got our, our couple again. We already know that we can't cross the line and move behind the subjects. And yet, if we add this simple cutaway shot, it's allowed us to cross the line without destroying the visual flow. The cut-in shot works in a similar way, but is used mostly to disguise lapses in time. This is achieved by cutting into closer detail within the main subject. And let's now look at an example of that. Our subject is writing a letter. To show the whole letter being written will take several minutes. So we cut into a close-up of our subject's face. When we cut back to our original shot, the letter is completed. In effect, we've condensed the action into just a few seconds. Yet the viewer gains exactly the same information as if we'd shown the whole task. The important thing to remember when out and about recording with your video movie is to be aware of the length of time that you allocate to each shot. Hold a shot too long and it becomes boring. Too short a length and the shot becomes confusing. Let's now take a look at a short sequence of footage that's been recorded using the various techniques and shots that we've just discussed. We'll identify each individual shot with a caption. and by using this video as a reference guide, you should soon be able to make your home movies look as professional as that. These basic techniques will soon become second nature, and many of you will want to take your hobby much further. Well, JVC have formed a unique club to help you do just that. The JVC Video Movie Owners Club is designed to advise and instruct its members on how to get the most enjoyment and the best creative effects from their equipment. Every member receives a quarterly magazine called Video File, which keeps you up to date with all the latest developments in video technology, as well as invaluable tips on improving your own video technique. As a member, you'll also be entitled to exclusive offers on video accessories and be invited to special Video Movie Club lectures and seminars. These will be held regularly at venues all over the country, giving every member the chance to come along. You'll find more about the benefits of joining our club in the leaflet supplied with your video movie. Meanwhile, here's a taste of the great offers awaiting new members. JVC have commissioned a further four video programmes available to club members at an exclusive low price. Each entertainingly presented programme deals clearly and concisely with two specific aspects of video production. You'll learn how to increase your skills and techniques in producing professional-looking programs. You'll be shown how to produce special effects and add captions to your programs. Lighting techniques are covered, showing how to deal with both natural and artificial lighting. And how about producing your own nature programs? Well, we'll show you how to get shots like these. Planning programs, gaining better sound and editing are all covered within the four JVC Technique videos. Well, we hope that you've found this program both useful and interesting, and we wish you every success in your new hobby. Bye-bye.